Charles, uh, Vice Chancellor, everyone. I particularly, I hate to say this, but I, I'm particularly interested in hearing from you. But I have been told that I have to speak, first of all, in the too difficult box. I think most of my life, Charles, um, ever since the National Union of Students um, chaired a debate in which I won the Observer Mace, um, judged by Tony Benn, Mark Bonham Carter, Lady Antonia Fraser, I wanted her as the prize, I remember the time, <laughs> and the various others. Uh, no, I mustn't say things like that, because you'll get the wrong impression of me. Because I, I was a survivor. I was one of only three ministers who survived Margaret Thatcher and was never sacked by Margaret. She was sacked 56. Um, uh, during all the years, I served her for three years in opposition and then 11 years in government. And she gave me all my promotions. But in many ways, when I look back, um, I have really spent most of my life listening to points of view with its clients, because I've been in my law firm now for 47 years. I can hardly wait for the 50th. Parliament only for 36 years. But I, I find myself um, uh, rewarded by listening to the views of others. And in many ways today has been wonderful. Because uh, I don't know whether you've been following the Leveson Inquiry, but I was brought up and went to school in Toxteth in Liverpool, so did Sir Brian Leveson. And when I first gave evidence to the Leveson inquiry, of course I know Brian reasonably, he was younger than me, six years younger than me, and called me Sir. So it was a whole new experience for me. And he started off, before I'd given evidence, he said, uh, I think uh, this whole inquiry should be aware that Lord Hunt and I went to school together many years ago, but I have no recollection at all of that episode. <laughs> and do you know what I said on oath? I said, but I do! <laughs> and the whole place collapsed in laughter, and Brian looked down at me. But, well, when Charles my fellow Privy Councillor asked me to come and speak to you this evening about media regulation. He explained that it's all part of this wonderful too difficult box. I presume this is the too difficult box because you, you can't really get close to me thanks to this. Um, but I had no idea it was going to be the impossible box. How on earth do I deal with media? First of all, I just wanted to say that I don't want to start pontificating about the BBC. Do you mind terribly if I leave that to my former cabinet colleague, uh, Chris Patton? You must invite Chris Patton. He'll come and tell you about the BBC. But what, what I've done today is to attend, um, this is the shortened version, uh, at uh, the QE2, listening to Lord Justice Leveson. And I'll include some comments about his recommendations. But I just want to thank him because what a Herculean task he has had to spend. In a way, I suppose, he was trying to cleanse the Aegean stables because he had to talk about and listen to others talking about some horrendous and often illegal activities. I do think that he is to be commended for having spent so much time and trouble in diagnosing what is seriously wrong with the newspapers and magazines in this country, and only a very small minority of them. And to highlight examples of unacceptable behaviour on the part of just a small number of journalists. His terms of reference were very wide indeed, and he reminded us all earlier today that the Module 4 recommendations were for a more effective policy and regulation that supports the integrity and freedom of the press whilst encouraging the highest ethical standards. Well, he's to be congratulated on this massive report. And of course, I and others will now spend a great deal of time reading through the report in full. But let me just set out my view about how I believe the newspaper and magazine industry can restore public trust and confidence in that great organisation. It is a fact that most professional 
Most systems of professional self-regulation have gone through a tremendous amount of reform in recent years. In 2009, I was asked by the Law Society of England and Wales to produce a, re a report on how to improve and how to structure the regulation of solicitors. And I set out to establish the principles, professional standards, and what would be appropriate regulation. And if I just share with you, these are areas that I've focused on all my adult life. Now, I realise that regulation is, is, to some extent, seen often as a panacea to supposedly pervasive anxiety about professions as such. But a number of professions have had to demonstrate how they benefit society in the face of a whole series of allegations of self-interest, in marking their own homework, and a genuine lack of public interest. And journalism may not be regarded as a traditional profession, but it has a unique place in public life. And ethics, standards and trust are as important to journalism as they are to any of the accepted professions. Now, some years ago, I introduced a debate in the House of Commons because I was Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. By the way, on the Today programme earlier this week, I reminded um, Jim Nocte, he said, because he was referring to another hunt where he got the name slightly wrong. And he said, at least I've never called you anything rude. I said, I remember, Jim, when you called me uh, and you said, we are delighted to have the Chancellor of the Ducky here on the programme. <laughs> anyway, he, for some reason, he never then asked me any difficult questions. But it is a fact that when I was Chancellor of the Duchy, I introduced what is called Nolan, or the Nolan Committee, and we persuaded James Mackay and John Major and I persuaded Michael Nolan that he ought to sit down and work out what were the standards of conduct for people in public life. And I presented this report to Parliament um, saying that people could no longer be trusted with integrity and they needed external scrutiny imposed on them. Just on my right sat the large and effective figure of Sir Edward Heath. He rose to his feet, and I've still got his... He didn't spare my blushes. He said, when I entered the House 45 years ago in 1950, we recognised every member of Parliament, man or woman, as a person of integrity. That was the attitude, and it was fully accepted. We have now reached a stage where every man and woman in the House is an object of suspicion. Why has that come about? I do not consider it healthy or satisfactory, and we must not fail prey to that approach. And as he said that, he pointed at me and urged me to disappear. Well, I'm afraid that like MPs, journalists can't rely on public trust or unquestioning acceptance that the press should just be free to regulate itself. Like other walks of life, it's now time for professional autonomy to give way to accountability. That's really what I'm now talking about. Journalism is a precious art and has its own powerful, specific traditions. And regulation has to be based on principles, not prescriptions. We have a good editor's code of practice, which is already in existence. And I think, Charles when I read uh, the editorial in the Eastern Daily Press, a chance to rebuild trust in the press but preserve free speech. I recognise that. Because as an MP for 21 years, it was my local press, my local newspaper, the local journalist, who kept me in touch with the real world and who I reckon set the gold standard for me in terms of ethical behaviour. Now, the CPS has recently introduced guidelines on, for assessing the public interest in cases affecting the media. And those new guidelines have only just come into effect on the 13th of September. And personally, I see much alignment for us 
between the way in which the public interest is defined in the editor's code and those set up from the DPP. I thought I might just, if I may, just spend a moment comparing the two. In the editor's code, there is a public interest defence in freedom of expression itself. And in the CPS guidelines, conduct which is capable of raising or contributing to an important matter of public debate. I think even those are a bit broad and vague for people's tastes. I reckon they could both be complemented or supplanted by a statement along these lines. There is a public interest in an open and robust debate on matters of scientific, moral or historical controversy. And that is the way I seek to defend the responsible exercise of freedom of speech. Now, there's just one example. As now incorrect or inaccurate statements of verifiable fact should not be subject to a public interest defence under the Code, and the PCC would also not expect them ever to enjoy any kind of public interest defence in the eyes of the CPS. But there's a lot here to discuss. I also recommended including a reference to a recognised or relevant self-regulatory code in the list of public interest criteria for pre-prosecution triage. And I think, I think here, again, thinking back to Brian Leveson earlier today, there's so much scope for developing these similarities, these codes, and these standards of ethical and professional conduct. Now, in section, um, the relevant section of the Human Rights Act, 1998, courts are required to have particular regard to the importance of the Convention right to freedom of expression, and where proceedings relate to journalistic, literary, or artistic material, or to conduct connected with such material, the court must also have particular regard to any privacy, any relevant privacy code. So today you've heard a lot about people talking about statutory backup, statutory recognition, statutory something or other, but it's already there, as long as there is a code. Section 32 of the Data Protection Act, 1998, under the heading Journalism, Literature and Art, creates a public interest defence which gives courts the power to take account of a publication's compliance with any code of practice. And the model established by the Defamation Act, 2009, um, in the Republic of Ireland, that, that may provide some helpful Example. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail. What I'm really summarising by saying is that I think the establishment of a code and proper monitoring and enforcement of that code with demonstrable independence and compliance <coughs> will raise the standing of journalism. Like professionals, journalists have a, a duty to protect the reputation of their trade as a whole. And of course, reputation, was it a fellow said, tis the immortal part of thyself? It is. And you can spend a lifetime building it up and lose it overnight. But journalists as such could do so much more to enhance public trust and confidence if they thought further about this. Now, let me explain. Last Last year, when I applied for the post of Chairman of the Press Complaints Commission, I did so on the basis, as a regulatory lawyer, that the PCC could never be described as a regulator. It had never had any powers of investigation or enforcement, and it had never been able to bind participants into long-term membership. I accepted that people had lost confidence in the existing system, and I concluded that the PCC should be replaced by a new credible regulator armed with the powers that the PCC has lacked. So I started with a blank piece of paper and soon reached the conclusion that this new body should have two arms, a standards and compliance arm and a complaints and mediation arm. And I really did want, and it was wonderful to see Brian Leveson say this today, 
I really did want a single named individual carrying personal responsibility within each of the publishers for compliance at each and every one of those publishers. And such an individual at the top of the organisation, and I'm talking about the publisher being responsible, I don't ever want to see a publisher arriving before a select committee saying, I had no idea what was going on down there. You're not allowed to get away with that. A senior partner of a law firm that now has two and a half thousand solicitors in it, I could never get away with that. Of course you can't. Because as in the Bering case, the judge said, the Admiral cannot be on the bridge and not know what's going on in the engine room. So I then worked out that the best way forward was to read through all the previous royal commissions. And I suddenly found myself attracted by the 1962 commission under Lord Shawcroft. Do you know what they said? And I did remind Brian Leveson of this, and I think it's contributed today to the fact he's not, a, he's not recommending a statutory regulator. Shawcroft said, a new system should be underpinned by commercial contracts and a state or statutory regulator is unnecessary. I found those words, and they, for me, gave me my lead. Because, I haven't said this already, but I think sending a message around the world that the UK, for the first time, has introduced a press law is something that must be avoided. I know I shouldn't reveal private conversations, but I was thrilled and delighted to meet that great lady, Aung San Suu Kyi. And I was wrongly introduced to her by the Lord Speaker. That, you know, overcome by the occasion. You must meet Lord Hunt, not chair of the press complaint, who is chairman of the British press. <laughs> and do you know what Aung San Suu Kyi said? And I said this to Brian Leveson. She said, you must be so proud. So proud. Well, I think if we sent a message across the world, we were now going to have a press law. What sort of message would that send? But you know, every newspaper and magazine has to take these rights responsibly and accept those responsibilities. Now, let's get back to Sir Brian Leveson, because I feel that there is a recognition now that we have come to a time where we have to set up a new, robust and effectively independent regulator for the press. And I'm heartened that most of the characteristics that I filled in on my blank piece of paper are now shared as goals by Sir Brian Leveson and others. OK, Sir Brian has added various other things which we must now explore and consider. But I hope that this common purpose can now result in a, speeding, a speedy and meaningful new system being created. Regulation can only be effective if the structure delivering it is fit for purpose. So, Sir Brian is to be congratulated on his work, and although I don't agree with all the conclusions, I do praise his dedication and commitment. And I just say this, and he said it earlier today, if the Newspaper and magazine industry is to retain the trust and confidence of the British people. It has to make sure that the unacceptable, outrageous and often illegal behaviour of a small minority of journalists can never ever be allowed to happen again. So we need, now need to find a way forward. And I just suggest we all now digest this report, seek our common ground and unite around it. And I welcome the fact that all three party leaders have said that they intend to do just that. Above all, it is key that the result is a new regulator with effective sanctions and teeth, which is independent from the industry and independent from the government. I have to say, though, Sir Brian, I'm not convinced statutory regulation including some sort of a supervision of press regulation by Ofcom, would have prevented the horrors of the past. 
They certainly wouldn't. What will prevent them from ever happening again, though, is for the press to sign up to a fresh start and a serious improvement in culture and governance. Now, I won't go into all the Hampton principles for regulation, which I've made a great deal of money out of quoting to my clients. If you want to ask me about Hampton, do. But there is good reason why we have always wanted to see better regulation. But the last thing we should do now is to embrace again statutory regulation of the press, which we haven't had in this country since the Licensing Act was repealed in 1696. And I thought I'd juxtapose two great quotations. First of all, Winston Churchill said this, a free press is the unsleeping guardian of every other right that free men prize. It is the most dangerous foe of tyranny. Under dictatorship, press, the press is bound to languish and the loudspeaker and the film to become more important. But where free institutions are indigenous to the soil and men have the habit of liberty, the press will continue to be the fourth estate, the vigilant guardian of the rights of the ordinary citizen. Hear, hear. But Karl Marx argued this. The free press is the ubiquitous, vigilant eye of a people's soul, the embodiment of a people's faith in itself. It is the spiritual mirror in which a people can see itself, and self-examination is the first condition of wisdom. So against that background, let me summarise, because you have every right to know what I now intend to do. Having been parachuted in to create a new regulatory structure, I want to respond positively to all Lord Justice Leveson's recommendations and hit the ground running. I want to take the process forward now. I still don't know why Lord Shawcross's recommendation of a contract-based regulatory system was not accepted, but, but I think it's still, it's still possible. I do, however, feel that the industry should now accept my recommendations in the following six-point plan. First, I'm going to call together a meeting of all the main publishers with a, view to, with a view to finalizing the terms of the contract and the regulation so that the commercial contracts can be entered into and signed as quickly as possible. I recognize this will involve bilateral contracts between the new regulator and more than 30 30 companies, it may take a little while, but we have to get on with it. In the meantime, I would like to establish a shadow trust board, which would then put in place the sort of independent appointment procedures for the new company. What are we going to call it? Shall I just call it for the moment NUCO? NUCO must have a clear independent majority, and I will be approaching a number of people in the next few days who will join with me in setting up the procedures for establishing this new independent authority. I recognise that there is a tapestry of views in the industry about what is independence, and I would hope that the, the Shadow Board will consult widely with the industry and other interested parties, including the Parliamentary DCMS Select Committee and the Secretary of State and other key uh, leaders during this process. Needless to say, throughout this period, we need to take all necessary steps to ensure that members of the public continue to have a fast, fair and free access to a complaints handling body. And perhaps, even more importantly, also have access to a 24-hour assistance with urgent pre-publication and anti-harassment concerns that have always been provided by the loyal staff that I have with me in the Commission. Thirdly, I want to get back to discussions with the Public Appointments Commis Commissioner, David Normington, about such procedures, how best to proceed, and get his advice to help guide the Shadow Board. Fourthly, I want a clear timetable for the implementation of the proposals, which I will then 
published shortly, which I hope would stimulate the widest possible consultation. And I want to see progress as quickly as possible. And certainly the deadline that I set myself must be at the latest 30th of June next year and earlier if we can. Next, my aim is to ensure that the valuable expertise within the PCC that I spoke about before is retained and will continue when NUCO is established. And I'll, of course, therefore begin consultations with all my staff to ensure that their positions are protected. And finally, six, I would like the industry to begin an in-depth review of the editor's code in the light of Lord Justice Leveson's report, where he's made a number of interesting suggestions. And also other issues that were raised at the inquiry, again with a, a clear timetable for implementing all these measures. I, of course I realise I will be judged by action, not words. I would very much welcome though the opportunity to report at an early stage to the Prime Minister, the Coalition Government, as well as to Parliament and the various key players in this. I'd also want to set up a regular reporting mechanism so that we can keep MPs and peers fully in touch with all the actions which are to be taken. But above all, we have to send a clear and positive message to the public that this great industry will redouble its efforts to deserve their trust and confidence.